Hey gang, it's Ash and Gonzo, and this is Genuine. Hey guys. What's going on? Not much. Uh, beautiful. Actually, today is a beautiful day here in uh, Dallas, uh, Texas. It's just 80 something. The sun is out, blue skies. I mean, it's just gorgeous. A lot better than this weekend, I'll tell you that. It was freezing. Well, so, so I wasn't in town. I was out of town. So okay. I'll tell you, I was, in, I was in Tempe, Arizona, and it was gorgeous out there. Good temperatures? Oh, my God, Ash. It was, it was in the – actually, it was in the 70 to 90 range, and it started out in the cooler side, but then it moved up to 90, but it was just gorgeous. Oh, my God. We were uh, – Julian actually went out there because there was a uh, ASU uh, prospect camp for hockey, for the hockey team. And okay. while he's a sophomore, he had wanted to go and try do the, the prospect camp. And we had agreed a few weeks ago. And, and so I took him, but it was just fantastic. Boy, what a beautiful place. And, uh, people, where is Tempe, Arizona? What's so, that near? So it's basically, um, it's, it's about 30 minutes away from Scottsdale. Okay. And it's literally 10 minutes away from the airport. Oh, fantastic. It's really in the vicinity of the airport. And it's uh, an Arizona State University is right in the smack middle of it. And it, have you ever been to A- I guess you've never been to ASU. No, I haven't been to ASU. Huge, beautiful campus. One of the things that I really liked about the campus was the fact that it has a little bit of an urban feel, okay? Okay. But it, because it's so close to the West Coast, it's got that California vibe to it. So people are on bikes, they skateboard. It's funny, you know how you see the locks that you can lock your, uh, your bikes and everything to uh, stand so that way they, that you can go to school, all that stuff? Uh-huh. They have that, but they have it for skateboards. Oh, wow. Right? And so I was like totally into that. I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. The campus is beautiful. It's, it's, it's just gorgeous and it's got the mountains close by. Uh, the, there's the Sun Devil Stadium, which is where the, uh, the football, uh, the football team, uh, plays at, it's basically carved into a, a, uh, a mountain. So it's so one pretty. of the, oh my God, it was just beautiful. And, and the vibe is so cool. And, uh, and you know, we, we took a tour of the campus. The campus is beautiful. Well done. It's got some beautiful facilities and, uh, and an interesting fact about ASU, which I didn't know. So apparently, uh, it's it, it ranked number one in innovation uh, on U.S. News World Report. Oh wow! And it you know who are actually the ones that were actually behind ASU? Who? It was actually uh, Stanford and MIT. Oh wow! I would so have guessed that. Neither would I. And and uh, and the other thing that's really cool about ASU is that they have a, a an affiliation with Mayo Mayo Clinic. Okay. Which, which makes sense because Mayo Clinic has a, has a hospital or a branch there in Scottsdale. And, uh, and so they support the medical services for the, uh, for the students. And then their medical school is also, the ASU Medical School is also affiliated with Mayo Clinic main campus. Okay. So you basically get an education that probably gets vetted and certified by the Mayo Clinic, which is basically, I mean, if it's not one of the top, you know, the top five medical and healthcare systems in the world. So, I mean, I was really, really impressed with, uh, with the place. And, uh, and it's actually a really cool place to visit and to hang out. We, we, we spent a few hours in the hockey rink because that's what we were doing there. But then when we had time off, we went around campus. We took photographs. We did the tour. Uh, it's a beautiful weekend, beautiful weekend. So we had Is that somewhere time. where Julian would be interested in going, do you think? Yeah, I think so. And, and that was the other reason we went out there. Um, the reason he is attracted to ASU is because two of his uh, mentors went to ASU. One is okay. uh, uh, Jeff Lewin, who used to be his coach at uh, Hockey Club of Dallas. And the other one, uh, Mr. McNay. Uh, who used to be his arts uh, professor or teacher in, uh, in, in, in school. And so he basically had that connection with ASU. And so he always wanted to go to ASU and see it because of these two, you know, mentors of his. 
And so uh, we took the opportunity of looking at it, and he definitely loved it. And so I think, you know, we're going we're gonna to rank them. What I did with uh, Julian in school is I told him, I need at least 25 places that you want to go. Wow. And, <laughs> right. And so tell me the 25 places you want to go, and, and at least we'll start working on that list and figure out where is it exactly that we're going to end up. Because you know, what, he's a sophomore right now, or is he a junior? He's a sophomore. Sophomore, so, okay. Yeah, but we have to, you got to start the application. Oh, yeah, the absolutely. The process so early. You know, if you wait till you're a senior, you're done, right? You're done. Yeah, you, you won't get in that first year. And I don't know about you, but, but and I want, I'd like to take your take on, uh, get your take on this, but I don't remember, well, at least, well, I went, I stayed in Puerto Rico for, for residency, I'm sorry, for residency for college and then medical school, but I can't remember being the processes as, complicated and arduous as it is today and it just may be the fact that I applied only to a couple of schools in Puerto Rico and maybe the process wasn't as onerous how was it for you it was I mean it was a tedious process for me I mean you had to like the process in and of itself from like making sure that you did the the tour so that like you want to make sure that they have you on record as doing the tours and showing your um your excitement or your just that you're, you want to be involved in that campus, but then right. the applications, the essays, the making sure that you're involved, like back when I applied, I remember like you needed a minimum of like six activities that you were involved in in high school, like right. extracurricular along right. with the grades. But so I'm the oldest of three. My youngest, my brother is nine years behind me. And I remember asking my parents whenever he went through this process, I was like, Hey, how has it changed? Cause we all, my brother, sister, and I all went to TCU. Right. So my parents knew what the process was for me, and then they knew what it was for my brother. And my mom was like, it is crazy how it's changed over nine years. Is that She's so? like, I can't even imagine. I remember her saying, and this is before we had Olivia. She was, I can't even imagine what it's going to be like when you kids have kids that are going through this college application process. Right. She's like, because for your brother, it was like, we had to start showing interest two to three years out versus a year and a half out. Like she's like, it's just crazy. You really have to kind of get on their radar right. and have them on your radar. So no, I think it's really smart that with Julian, you're like, A, let's make sure we have enough to choose from. Right. So you, you're not limiting your options. Um, but no, I, and, and again, my brother is 28 now. So that was what, eight years ago that he was going through this process. So I can't right. even imagine how it's changed since then. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I, n- neither my wife or I, I mean, Natalie went, went to, to school in Loyola in Baltimore. Okay. Okay. So, so she went through the college process to go to the United States and she, and she applied for grants and all that stuff and funding and all that stuff. But you know, other than that, I mean, I have no clue. And, and well, state schools are a whole, it's a whole it's nother a ballgame totally than, than ballgame. private schools. So, like, you know, we were, we're fortunate enough that we're able to do this, but what we did is we got Julian a, a college counselor. Okay. And so basically this person, again, we have to pay for it, but this person basically takes charge of that. It's a great and, investment. <laughs> right. It is. And then basically it, he her, helps with the essays, you know, helps with trying to hone in on, on an interview, uh, places you want to interview at, you know, all these, all these little details. That, uh, that I honestly wouldn't know how to do. Or saying, hey, you really need to start getting, like, branching yourself out in this area to really fully encompass right. everything. Right. That and sort so, of thing. And so we're still, we're still actually, I mean, we just started. I mean, the right. reality about it is that we just started. And, um, and uh, you know, we'll find out if it actually is worthwhile or not. I mean, you know, at the end of the at the end of the thing, I told Julian, just just go somewhere that you're going to be happy, and you're going to study something that you're going to be happy for the rest of your life. Right. And, and you know what? I went through college, and honestly, I started with one career path, and within a year, I figured out that that wasn't it for me. What did you start with? I believe it or not, I started with computer programming. Really? And, and I wish I'd stayed there. Right. That's what <laughs> <you know>? now <laughs> I'm. Happy. Now as a doctor, I'm banging my house, my head against the wall, saying, "Why did I stay doing that?" Right. <laughs> it was probably, I probably made a lot of money just by doing computer programming, and I would have, you know, I was on the way. Listen, when I when I decided to go into college, I, I, I knew that there was something about these computers. Again, mind you, 1985, the internet didn't exist. Um, computer programming 
was I was three. You didn't have to say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> well, imagine how much has changed. Okay, if college has right. changed that much, and that and there may lie the reason why I still I, right now I can't fill that that those applications out. But you know, it, it, not digressing too much about the subject, but you know, we we were sitting in in what we call the computer lab. And it was actually a auditorium that you basically sat down and did computer programming. And we were doing these, these, these lo logarithms and algorithms. We called it algorithms. And we would just write them on these archaic um, programs. I mean, I did basic. I learned a little bit of, of, of language like COBOL and Fortran, which were the big, the two big uh, uh, programming platforms. Uh, Fortran was used for uh, for science and so that was kind of the thing that you did and then there was there was COBOL with, which was the other program but it was much more a business program oh my god and I remember at, <laughs> I, I, I was at the beginning I was kind of excited but then the, then I, I wasn't the type to be stuck in a computer lab no for that's our, not I you mean, I would have it would have ironically surgery is not very much different than being in that computer lab you just have to be focused on what you're doing but hours on end, I could not do it. And so I quickly found out that I didn't like that. And I remember my last test, my final test on, on computer programming was I had to write a tax form, you know, like you do for, uh, for all these, these on, on, you know, on service or on online tax returns that you fill in. Uh -huh. Ironically, we're talking about that today because today's right. tax day. Okay. But oh, oh, help me! What's the name of the of the big uh, company? Like TurboTax or yeah, something TurboTax. like that. Okay, you're right. So it was the beginning of that. So it wasn't even okay. the beginning of that. There was there was nothing like that that existed. So we had to write our final was writing a tax return based on some criteria that the teacher gave us as our final. Okay, I looked at the damn thing and I just handed in the test blank. No, I, you didn't. Oh, I handed it <laughs> blank. I said, I'm done. <laughs> okay, this is it. And that's how I walked out. And and then you immediately went switch to medicine? Well, no. Th so that, that's, that's, no. Well, so no. So what happened from that point on is that I, I honestly, well, first I got a letter from the vice <laughs> dean of academic affairs because my grade point average at that time was 1.0. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was just pathetic. But in any case, so what happened that at that point is that I had to make a decision as to what do I want to do in my life. And so I remember uh, the following semester, I took a variety of things. I took, I took religion, which didn't work out. I took out, um, I took uh, ethics. I took uh, history. I took uh, biology. I took math. And I took, you know, a couple of courses that at least it, I had a little bit of flavor of everything. And so at the end, I said, you know what? I kind of like this idea of biology, right? And so right. I had got into my head that I was like, you know what? Maybe I want to be a doctor because I didn't want to be a researcher. I didn't know that researcher was going to take, doing research was going to take me anywhere. But then, but then I figured, okay, well, maybe, maybe teaching, but I didn't like the idea of being in the classroom. Although, you know, we, we do that now right. as, as we teach residents. And so I said, well, you know, being a doctor, and I always had this idea that I wanted to be something like a surgeon. You know, um, when I was in eighth grade, I remember dissecting a frog and thinking that that was in, in biology class and thinking that was one of the most cool things that I've ever seen looking at the human, at uh, the frog anatomy and all that stuff. And I remember doing the chest, the chest part and seeing the lungs and seeing, I mean, these were big frogs, right? Right. Um, that we had captured and we actually put formaldehyde in their mouths and we anesthetized in that way. And we did the, the dissection of the, of the, of the frog. But I always had that in the back of my mind. And so I said, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a doctor. And so I told mom after the end of my second semester, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to be a doctor, mom. And she's like, are you crazy? And she just chewed <laughs> into me. Right. Because no way. Right. She couldn't understand how I was going to make it after I failed my first semester. Right. And so, I mean, I rightfully so. Exactly. Just like any other parent would have done. Like, but she looked at me like, I mean, she chewed me out. <laughs> so the summer came, I took a couple, a couple of summer courses just to accelerate because I knew I wasted a year. And then, uh, and then I, the following semester, I took something like chemistry, genetics, calculus. I mean, some 
god awful classes that were really high end and and so and I got a 4.0 average. I mean, I aced all of them. And I showed my grace to mom. She says, you did that on purpose. You're trying to drive me crazy. I'm like, no, mom, I really like this. <laughs> I like. So anyway, from that point on, I stayed, I stayed in, on the path of medicine. And here I am, you know, 30 years later, and I'm still in the, in the medical. That's path. crazy. I would have never guessed that was the path that you oh, started on with. Oh. Just knowing you professionally, I guess, that, like, I would have guessed that you had had it in your mind at an early age. That's what you wanted to do. And. I, you you know straight what, narrow because, like that's that's really entertaining to hear like it makes me like you even more <laughs> well, well let me tell you so but the, the the funny thing about it is that if i can dial back and remember when i was growing up and i must have been five years old or something going to the pediatrician and seeing the pediatrician and telling him you know what i want to be just like you when i grow up I remember okay. that. I remember being in his office and telling him that. And he's looking down at me, probably staring at this little kid and look at, and probably feeling good about it because he's, he's, he's basically a, a role model, right? But, right. Uh, but he probably patted me on the back. He said, you got so much to go. So, <laughs> you know? That's funny. I wanted to be a pediatrician when I was little too. Really? So how did you get into the medical field? Um, how, was your, I mean, how was your path? Because, I mean, you, you, you went into nursing, you you, you did some extremely exciting and high-end stuff, which I still try to get you to do it again. Right. But, <laughs> but, you know, you got into the field of transplant. How did you end up doing that? Well, so I ended up at TCU, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. But thankfully, I, was at, I, I knew I wanted to do something in medicine. I just I didn't think I wanted to go full-blown medical school, but I didn't know. And thankfully, I was at a place that had one of the top 10 nursing schools in the country. Uh -huh. and. So I guess it was my sophomore year that I was like, you know what? I'm going to give this whole nursing thing a shot. I, cause I had already knocked out like a lot of the electives. So I really wasn't going to be super behind. Right. Um, and so the way TCU is, is that like, you don't have to go two years. And then like a lot of these schools, you have to go two, two and a half years, then apply to get into nursing school. Well, I could go ahead and declare nursing and immediately roll into nursing school. And then I had to prove myself to stay in nursing school. Right. And so did that. And I remember, um, gosh, it was my second semester junior year when you do your critical care ICU rotation and I fell in love. Like they called me the little sponge because uh -huh. I would just, I would go in there and just absorb everything. I loved everything about the ICU. I remember I told my parents, I was like, if I can't get a job in critical care out of school, I will change professions. Like I will <laughs> not do anything but ICU right. critical care. Cause that, I, like I'm an adrenaline junkie. I love, I thrive you on, on that stuff. You, hit, you took the term right out of my mouth. The and so that is that if to be, to be doing that, you got to have yeah, a lot of well, especially when you're 22 and yeah. you're a, a new grad. And so I landed a really good internship at a hospital here in Dallas where they really, I mean, they really school you before you're kind of thrown up. Cause I mean, ICU is just, it's such a huge world and <clears throat> people's lives. Are, I mean, and all of medicine, people's lives are at stake, but in critical care, as you know, I mean, Absolutely. your life or death situation. So had a great internship, had great preceptors and that's what I did for gosh, nine years and then transitioned to cath lab, which kind of fed off of ICU. I needed that background and then ended up in heart transplant. So cardiac has always been a passion of mine. Cause that's all I've ever done. Right. But, um, and you no, did it really well when you were doing it. Trust me. <laughs> for those that, 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 that are listening, you know, the way that Ash and I met, uh, if you haven't figured it out already is that I, I did transplants or I do heart transplants. And then Ash was one of our coordinators or was one of my coordinators when I, um, uh, in the program before she, she took a permanent maternity leave, <laughs> left me hanging, but in any case, no, but, but that's how Ash and I got to know each other. It's our cardiovascular background that basically right. uh, put us back together, but also our, our ability to talk everybody's ears off like we're doing right now. <laughs> But so, so then you didn't know going in that you wanted to, to do medicine. No, I, 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 like I said, when I was little, kind of like you, I wonder if that's something that all little kids say that they want to like, cause I, my mom says still to this day, she's like, all you ever said, she's like, other kids were like, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a lawyer. And she's like, you wanted to be a pediatrician. So they were really shocked that I didn't like go into pediatric ICU. 
But I had a really, really traumatic rotation in nursing school with that. And it scarred me. And I was like, there's no way I could ever do pediatric ICU until I have my own family, my own kids. Like it was just, I just wasn't mature enough to handle some of the things that I saw in the pediatric ICU. Yeah. And it was just, it was scarring. Well, um, and, I, and you hit it on the head that, that it, it takes a very, very different type of person and a special personality yes. for that. I mean, for cardiac surgery and cardiac transplantation in adults, it is a, can be a, an emotional roller coaster. Oh, absolutely. But boy, I, I respect and admire the people that can do pediatrics. And oncology. And oncology. Forget about that, those fields. I, I, have, I have, that is such a difficult for me personally. I know that people turn it into fulfilling and can say, well, this is really fulfilling and all these things. But that's one field that I, I never was good at. And it's just because I got too emotionally involved. That was it, and that you. What, and I hate to say this, but the amount of child abuse cases oh. that I saw in that oh, short yeah. period of time—that's yeah. what—that's what scarred me. And I was like, yeah. I can't do this. I can't like let me take care of the individual who's ninety and is telling me I've lived a great life. Yeah. Like if I go into this surgery and it doesn't work out well, you know what? I've had ninety years, and yeah. I'm like, I can do that. Like yeah. I like. I like having patients who have that persp- who have had the chance to develop that perspective on life. Well, and you touched a little bit about medicine and our career evolution, and and this is not one of the subjects that we intended to talk about, but you touch on the on the part of taking care of adult people with uh, cardiac pathology. But you know, another really cool thing that happened actually in your old stomping grounds of Fort Worth that was first uh, in the history of medicine in Fort Worth. I don't. We did the first mitra clip. Really? We did the first mitra clip last Monday. Oh, did you? Go Monday. It, yeah. I posted, Congrats. I, we posted it on LinkedIn. We posted it on Facebook. We posted it on everywhere. That's huge. I know, right? Yeah, that's huge. That's huge for you. Got the huge for the program. That's huge for Fort Worth. Right. I mean, because normally people from that area of the Metroplex had to come over to Dallas. Well, or, and, or go to Plano and a lot right. of people. And you know, the history between Dallas and Fort Worth is, a, is, is one that's a big divide, just like UNC and Duke are. Right. I mean, there's a huge competitive uh, spirit between both cities. And, and Fort Worth, uh, you know, had always been clear, has always been clear about who they are in relationship to Dallas. And exactly. Dallas is the same way. Anyway, you being a, a TCU grad, I, I totally understand the culture out there in terms of what Fort Worth is and, and all that stuff. But being able to do something first, first Ash, that was so exciting. The team, I mean, we, we started, let me see, we started, it, was, it wasn't Monday, it was Tuesday morning of last week. We did the first Mitra clip, and it took us all but 51 minutes to do, which That's was- That's so exciting. I know, for the, for the uh, and, and it involved the cath lab team, so everybody right. in the cath lab was there, surgeons were there, um, uh, the, there was a cardiologist, by, uh, uh, let me tell you, an incredibly gifted- uh, It's a huge, like- it's a huge team effort that goes into those procedures. Like, yeah, and if people look, don't realize that, it's it's so no. many dynamics that right. come into play to right. make this one surge. It's not like you just roll into the OR. It is there's so absolutely many. not. And I want to give a shout out to, to 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 the entire cardiovascular team of of the hospital in Fort Worth that we did this in. Um, but I also want to recognize a couple of people that were instrumental in doing that. I mean, the, the Fort Worth Mitral Valve Clinic, listen, guys, if you're listening, I can't say greater things about you guys. You guys are definitely the rock, the foundation of what we've been able to achieve in mitral valve care in Fort Worth over the last year. And, and there's so many great things that are coming out of that program. The people that are being cared for, it's amazing. So first shout out to, to Sharon, Diana, Fee, Christy, everybody in the Echo Lab. Uh, Bunny, uh, I'm sure I'm going to forget names. Um, uh, I mean, Nicole, everybody, everybody there. I just want to say thank you. But, but I also want to tell, say thank you to two physicians who are key in this. Chris Foster, Chris Foster from cardiothoracic anesthesia. Great guy, the chief of cardiac anesthesiologist. 
he was doing the case there, doing the echo. Those guys play a huge role. Huge role. You don't realize what the anesthesiologists play in these surgeries. Incredible. And the other one that I got to give a huge shout out is is to my colleague and partner in cardiovascular medicine, uh, Amir Malik. He's an interventional cardiologist. I got to tell you, this guy's got one of the most amazing hands and, and structural vision that I've seen in a cardiologist. Uh, Amir and I have been working together for about a year now and I've got, it's great admiration and great respect for him. And so you can find them both They're They're in Fort Worth. And let me tell you, those are two guys that I put my hand, my, my life on. Uh, That's awesome. Well, my, congrats to, to your whole team. Sounds Thank like you. it was a huge success. Thank you. But then the other thing that we're going to, they're working on doing first are two really exciting things. And I told this in the last show that we had. Uh, LVADs are coming in at the tail end of the year. So we'll have a, a big LVAD uh, uh, project coming and developing. And shortly thereafter, heart transplantation, which will hopefully will be also the first in, in Fort Worth to be doing heart transplants. So we're excited about all those things. And, and that happened last week. I didn't have a chance of talking to you, but that's, that was part of my week as well. That's awesome. So, uh, so we, were ta- we touched on tax day. So you did, did, you, uh, did you do your taxes? They have been done. <laughs> that sounds like they have been done. <laughs> they have been done. <laughs> so, so are you getting money back, hopefully? Or are you uh, I think, if, I, if I'm correct, we are breaking even. Okay, well, that's good. As yes. long as you don't have to pay. Pay. Uh, pay we'll get the like, big break next year with the house. Absolutely. That'll be nice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's good. That's good. Yeah. What about you guys? Well, I, we basically submitted it, and I haven't heard from my accountant. accountant. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Every year we do get some reimbursement. Um, I'm hoping that we do it this year. What, what we did last year is the money that we saved or we got in re- for reimbursement. Uh, we put it towards a nice vacation. So this year we're going to England. Oh, fun. Uh, when are you guys, that's so funny. Cause we're in the process of planning all our summer trips as well. So we, when are you guys going to England? So we're leaving, uh, the end of June and coming back the uh, beginning of July. Okay. So we're, we're going to go out there. I want to, we always wanted to take the kids to some European trip. Right. And so I, we figured that using the tax money, we would actually take them to England. And the reason I chose England, I mean, we, we could have gone anywhere, Spain, France, you know. Right. But the reason that England was attractive was because of the language. Right. The language barrier wouldn't have been that big of a deal. And I wanted them to have that first experience of going to London uh, in which they would feel a little comfortable with the language and not get put off by, you know, maybe – having to try to interpret, you know, French or, or even Spanish while we speak Spanish, they don't speak Spanish fully. And so I I didn't want them to feel uncomfortable and I at least create that environment. So we're going, we're going or have them exposed to that environment. So we're going to London uh, and spending a a few days there. Uh, But, but we're really stoked and the kids are totally stoked about it. So we can, I can't wait to go. So this uh, is their first trip across the pond, I'm assuming, correct? They're, they're, that, this is their first trip across the pond, and they... That's so fun. I remember my first trip. It's just, it's, they're going to get bit by that bug, and they're going to want to go back every year. <laughs> well, and I, have, and I have somewhat of a connection with, uh, with, uh, with England. You see, my father, uh, my parents were divorced. Okay. But my father... Uh, lived in New York City. So we used to visit him when, when he was in New York City uh, quite a bit. And then after New York City, he moved to London. And he worked there at a re- retail, kind of a big, like a, what you would call a gap, but whatever it was back in the day. Okay. Uh, it was, a, it was the, the English gap equivalent, right? Okay. Gotcha. So he worked, but he worked for corporate, for headquarters, for the headquarters. And so we actually went and visited him and, and we stayed in London. And I remember Oh, I, you know, we, we, I must've gone to England and visiting him in London at least twice, uh, maybe even three times. But, uh, one of the most memorable times that I, that I, that we had when we were actually, um, out there was, uh, I, after my senior year in high school, before I started college, I, I basically went to see him and stayed with him for a couple of weeks in, in London. And it was during uh, Live Aid. Remember Live Aid? 
Yeah. Okay, so Live Aid was happening that year, 1985, when I graduated from, uh, from college. I'm sorry, from high school. And then, uh, and then the other thing that was impressive, was incredible to witness was Wimbledon. Oh, that would be such a great thing to go oh, on. I've always, God. that's like a bucket list. Well, exactly. And so, and so, but it, the, the guy who won Wimbledon that, that year was a phenom uh, called, uh, named Boris Becker. And he was 18 years old. That's and a killer he, name. Well, yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, and he was, he was basically the one who won it all that year in Wimbledon as a men's champion. So I had an opportunity to be in England when that happened in, in London. And so let me tell you, it was, it, so, so I have, I have all those vivid memories of being in England and in London. And so I want to give that to the boys. So we, uh, so we can go out there and, and enjoy ourselves. Oh, that's so fun. You all guys right. are going to have a blast. How about you? Are you planning on it? What, what are you guys looking into? Well, we're going to Naples here shortly. Naples, uh, Florida, not Italy. Um, here in a few weeks, uh, Lance, my husband, his mom lives there. So, oh, cool. and they have a great place, um, great beach, and fun to take Olivia. So, we're going to go there. And then we always go up to Cape Cod and Nantucket. Um, yeah. Lance's family has a place in Chatham, yeah. uh, Massachusetts, which is great. And so, we go up there and then we're going to end up going to Colorado with my family, which I grew up doing. So a bunch of stateside trips, but um, nonetheless, really, really excited. Well, that's awesome. It's still one of those things. She's, I mean, she's only a year and a half, so you can't do like, she's still too young to like really go for like the Disney parks or things like that. But that's, that's some, it was funny. Lance the other day was like, I can't wait to take her to Disney. World. Oh like, my it's God. It's going to be so much fun. <laughs> oh my God. And let me tell you, those are the, as, as you, as, as they reach certain milestones, Disney, Disney world or Disneyland. Okay. Are milestones in the life of any child. Trust right. me. Right. I still remember going my first time. Oh my God. I, I remember mom saving pennies and taking us to Disney world. Uh, do you do you rather go to Disneyland or Disney World, or does it matter? Well, I've never been to Disney. So I've been so Disney World's in Florida, correct? Yep. yep. Okay, so that's where we went, and it was funny because my dad. So, like I said, I'm one of three, and my brother's nine years younger than me. And mm-hmm. my dad had said he's like, "We are going to wait until we do not have to deal with strollers at Disney World." He goes, right. "That is my own." So Absolutely. I was in high school my first time to go really? but I still had a black because I mean my brother was nine years younger yeah so like that and my dad again he's like I'm not trekking strollers around this place like <laughs> we're gonna go and enjoy it and yeah. and I still remember like downtown Disney and just little details of it and it was so fun but it's crazy because I looked at my brother who was so much younger and loved it and here I was in high school and I loved it so it really is a place that no matter what your age you love it magical we we, right you know what we used to so have you been to disneyland i have not so that's why i can't say which i prefer because i've only been to disney world let me tell you if you if i rather go to disneyland really disney world absolutely Well, is it because you can surf while you're out on the west coast (laughs) that is true although they have a wave park in disney world but i thought i think that the, the reason that i like disneyland better is that it's much more controlled it's, okay. It's not as sprawled out as Disney World. And, right. And, and let me tell you, for Olivia, I think that she would I, – I, she's still little, but I think in a year or two, you can take her to Disneyland, and it's manageable. It's okay. Not, it's not this, 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 this uh, so much land. And, and so I honestly do believe that if you take her to Disney – Land. land you have disneyland and then you have in front of it you got california adventures which okay is where uh bug life and cars and all these other uh shows and it's actually kind of a universal type of deal so it's actually really fun i would i would recommend that you go to the california one start with that because the other one you can go to epcot you can go to universals you can i mean right so much more to do and it's no so that's so great. good to know I, I i would recommend that in a heartbeat one one thought about what you were saying, and I know that we got a couple. Of, this is this, guys. This is what happens every week. That sh- <laughs> we we I, we it's both of us sit down and we we carve out what are we going to talk about? We got to talk about this. We got to talk about that, and we got so enthrall these other issues. And I hope that you find them interesting and leave comments because we we can all I, I, again. 
the best tour guide for San Francisco is Ash. Okay? <laughs> so if you're listening, ask Ash anything about San Francisco. But in any case, without going, going too far away from the subject of Disney World. So we took, um, when Julian was probably around, I'm going to probably around four. Um, we went to, we went to Disney World and you hear, I hear the producer in the background. So she's in her room too. <laughs> that tells you how loud she is. We got two minutes before before finishing the show, so I'm going to be very quick, and then we'll go on to just sign off. But um, so Julian was actually um, uh, four years old, and we wanted to get the monorail train set to take home with us, right? Okay. So I take him. I've taken to the monorail. He buys a monorail and we get on the monorail, uh, you know, going back to the hotel. So we purchased the thing at one of the Disney stores. He's holding it. He's staring at it. And he looks at me and gives me this big grin, you know, like they do. And, you know, they're so satisfied and happy. Right. And then he turns to me and says, you see, dad, dreams do come true. Oh, my gosh. That's like a Disney commercial. <laughs> and on that note, we're going to sign off because we're already out of time. I want to thank everybody who's listening for tuning in to the Ash and Gon show uh, and genuine. Uh, thanks again for listening. We got a bunch of things that we want to uh, talk about. We'll put it on the next podcast. Keep on listening and really do uh, thank you for all the comments and the likes. Ash. Uh, Y'all have a great week and we'll see you next week on genuine. See you guys. <laughs>